contest is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Good afternoon and welcome to the South Shore Clean Cities Maycock Green Fleet CNG Success Stories. My name is Ryan Lissick. I'm project manager for South Shore Clean Cities, and I'd like to thank everyone for attending today and to our speakers for allowing us to share their stories and successes. Just a reminder, all attendees are on listen-only mode, and today's webinar will be recorded and shared on the South Shore Clean Cities resources page on our website. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them in the questions box on the panel to the side. If you have questions for a specific speaker, please address it accordingly. We will be monitoring the questions throughout and address them at the appropriate times. So we will get started right now. We're gonna be hearing from Mark Rowe from Trillium, Matt Lebowski from City of South Bend Central Services, Amy Hill from South Bend Public Transportation Corporation, also known as SB Transpo. But for right now, I'm gonna start talking to you, give you some background on some South Shore Clean Cities. And here we go. All right, so South Shore Clean Cities is headquartered in beautiful St. John, Indiana. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, we are designated the 71st Clean Cities Coalition on June 15th, 1999. We're nearly 100 Clean Cities coalition, coalitions nationwide. In the last decade alone, South Shore Clean Cities members have reduced greenhouse gas emissions by 607,000 tons and displace over 93 million gas gallon equivalent. So today we're talking with fleets and vendors from our MACA Green Fleet Program and Northern Indiana Green Fleet Program is managed by South Shore Clean Cities. This is the Michigan Area Council of Governments. And this includes fleets from Elkhart, Marshall, Kosciuszko, and St. Joseph counties. The whole goal of the program is to improve the environmental performance of public, private, and nonprofit vehicle fleets in Northern Indiana. And just as we have our goals in South Shore Clean Cities, we bring those into the Northern Indiana Green Fleet Program, looking for ways where we can lower our dependence on foreign oil through alternative fuels and vehicles. Um, South Shore Clean Cities currently guides over 32 Maycog area municipal, county, school, and university member fleets to help mitigate those barriers associated with sustainable transportation adoption while creating policies supporting vehicle emission and petroleum use reductions. So how do we do it? We do it through a variety of different educational opportunities that highlight different fuel and technology workshops, trainings, and seminars. It also comes from with fleets that are already utilizing these types of technologies and fuels and using the different items and lessons learned with them, just kind of like what we're doing today. So we recognize and we, we have certification for fleet leaders taking steps to improve environmental performance and efficiency, branding and promotional tools to help fleets leverage earned certification status, informational resources, including current technology options, market conditions, laws and incentives, and there's always new technology coming out, laws and different incentives come out, feels like weekly sometimes. We use our connections that we have with our different vendors that offer uh, sustainable transportation options through a variety of different fuels. And then we can also combine this with some outside funding with grant opportunities and other state and federal incentive programs to ultimately lessen the cost burden of these different types of technologies and projects on the fleet. 
uh, professional, professional consultation, including a green fleet audit and emissions quantification. And in a uh, time where everyone's doing these greenhouse gas inventories, I think what you really see is, depending on any size of a fleet, larger the company, larger the entity, they're going to have a uh, larger fleet, which is going to require them uh, to have a larger greenhouse gas emittance coming from their transportation side overall. So our green fleet audits, what the data that we're really looking for in order to do that fleet analysis is we're looking just for some of the basic data that every fleet should be tracking already. So we're looking for the annual fuel usage, annual miles traveled and or hours used, total number of vehicles and equipment, vehicle and equipment type, make, model, and year, fuel type. We're also looking at the average vehicle and equipment life cycle of those uh, and, uh, fuels and vehicles, uh, downtime for fueling and maintenance, and what does that fuel cost, not just now, but over the last couple of years, and also how can those fuel costs be projected in the future? Uh, step two of our Green Fleet Audit, we're going to look at the different cost comparisons in a uh, formal fleet analysis report. So this cost comparison for the various sustainable fuel and vehicle technologies, also comparing to what are the current operation in fuels, the availability and location of fueling options. We're gonna be looking at personalized recommendations for short and long-term fleet purchase plans. We're gonna be looking at providing total cost of ownership and return on investment analysis. We're gonna also offer some suggestions for implementing cost-saving programs and training such as idle reduction information on potential funding. Uh, there are gonna be opportunities out there that we can include to uh, demonstrate and provide for the different project implementation. Um, and at the end of the day, the Green Fleet Audit is basically assessing the needs of each fleet that we're working with in order to find what makes the most sense for them from both an emission and a cost uh, perspective. So what's it all about in the end? It's about partnerships, grant acquisitions, and making sure that we're implementing these different fuels and projects for the next uh, coming years. There's a variety of different options out there. And of course, in any state, there's Indiana Volkswagen Settlement Funding. We have been very successful in the state of Indiana. We want to continue that success. There's DieselWise in Indiana. We've been a numerous uh, annual awardee through that. There's also EPA funding that comes out annually, both for non-road, off-road, and some uh, school bus funding as well. There's also Indiana Office of Energy Development that they have annual funding that they have to offer to different fleets and different opportunities. And working with us, being a part of the Green Fleet, that's where you can keep up to date on the, all the different opportunities that are available and not just now, but into the future. And we can look at different ways where we can implement these kind of different uh, ways that can save you money, just not from the upfront costs, but also for a lifetime of the equipment or vehicle. All right. So there's our contact information with a beautiful picture of some of me. Um, so there, please feel free to reach out and we will be uh, sharing this information via webinar afterwards. But if you have any questions, we're always here to help. And that is what I have coming up. So the next, speaker of today is going to be Mark Rowe from Trillium. He, Mark Rowe is the Senior Manager of Business Development, and I'd like to welcome Mark Rowe right now. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, and thank you, uh, all attendees, for uh, spending some time with us to, to talk about uh, our experience with 
uh, alternative fuels and you know, natural gas. Um, I am Mark Rowe uh, with Trillium. I've, I've been um, you know, covering alternative fuels here in the Midwest uh, since 2009. Um, and I'm Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, you know, who, who Trillium is, um, and some things to you know, consider uh, for your fleets uh, with alternative fuels you know, broadly, uh, specifically towards natural gas, uh, and then you know, some, some resources at your disposal, as well as you know, some success stories uh, uh, near, near and dear uh, to Indiana uh, that, that I'm aware of. So, uh, by way of background, uh, you know, Trillium is a, a part of the Loves family of companies. Loves is a, a large uh, on-highway um, fuel distributor retailer uh, with over 500 locations uh, in 41 of the, the lower 48. Uh, they have uh, been growing rapidly uh, for, for as long as I've known them. Uh, and we continue to expand our, our on-highway offering. Uh, I think year to date, um, we're nearly two dozen locations opened uh, in 2020, uh, and there's there's more to come uh, yet this year and beyond. Um, Gemini is uh, is our uh, fuel delivery division. Uh, they operate a, a, a fleet of uh, over 800 tractors uh, delivering fuel uh, to the the Loves locations nationwide. Uh, we have about 40 uh, CNG uh, Class 8 trucks on the road today. Uh, those are all of the uh, using the new near zero engine uh, from Cummins 12 liter. Uh, anecdotally, for any heavy duty users on the phone or uh, uh, of interest, um, we're, we're seeing great um, efficiency with those new engines. Um, we've exceeded our miles per gallon uh, projections out of the gates, and um, I think the folks at Gemini are, are, are very happy uh, with their uh, latest. Can you hear me, Ryan? Yes, All Mark, right. we hear you now. Technical, technical difficulty there. Apologize. But uh, not sure where I got cut off, but um, I, I was in the midst of just explaining that uh, Gemini is, is really happy with their, their next-gen 12-liter you know, CNG product, and uh, we'll be expanding that fleet uh, you know, in, uh, in the near future. Uh, Musket is our wholesale and commodity division, uh, really responsible for uh, procuring in mass quantities of product for the enterprise. Uh, Trillium, uh, I'll tell you more about us in just a second. And kind of the last piece of the, the Loves family of companies, uh, Speedco, they're a well-known uh, on-highway uh, maintenance shop that uh, we're integrating into Loves locations going forward. Uh, that's uh, just just a, uh, a snapshot of the, the Loves footprint nationwide. It's, uh, as you can see, we've got great coverage in the Midwest and uh, and, and Indiana. It, really, what this represents for any you know on highway uh, fleets or uh, you know those municipal fleets that operate in a vicinity of a loves is this is opportunity for alternative fuel deployment in our network. So, um, just thought I would highlight that. Um, Trillium is uh, we, we've been in business for uh, nearly 30 years. We're uh, an alternative fuels infrastructure provider. Uh, our core business is and has been CNG for uh, the bulk of our existence. We've more recently expanded to other alternative fuel offerings. Uh, we, we've completed a very large hydrogen facility in California uh, and have uh, deployed some light duty EV charging uh, out west and, and are looking at other uh, opportunities to add EV charging to Love's locations. Uh, and are involved with some heavy-duty electric vehicle charging projects as well. And I uh, look forward to, to seeing where, where both the future of, of hydrogen and 
uh, battery electric buses end up. Uh, but at our core, we're a design build um, firm uh, that specializes in compressed natural gas. Uh, we design and built and, and currently maintain the, the Transpo uh, facility in South Bend that you'll hear more from Amy on later today. Uh, and we, we have built or operate over 200 total locations nationwide, uh, including 67 of our own retail CNG locations. Next slide. Um, so this this is a pretty fancy graphic. I, I thought I would tuck it in there, but but it's representative of really what we do, uh, and that's to be a a partner for your alternative fuel, um, your fleet decision making process. Um, so we we can be involved on the front end in helping uh, with analytics and seeing what makes sense from an alternative fuel vehicle deployment uh, for your particular application, uh, or or on the back end as as you've got alternative fuel vehicles on the road. And are looking for uh, you know a partner to meet those uh, fuel needs of those alternative fuel vehicles. Uh, we can be involved in that as well, uh, and anything in between. So, um, next slide. So it, you know, for those fleets that are you know interested in CNG or uh, maybe considering you know CNG deployment in the future, I wanted to just put some bullet points together that. I have found to be, you know, helpful in, in you know, my travels over the years. Uh, certainly, you know, want to you know, kind of identify those those fleet vehicles that may be candidates for CNG conversion. Um, we see uh, the largest number of deployments with CNG today in heavy duty applications. Uh, that's not to preclude, you know, light duty uh, and medium duty vehicles, but uh, the lion's share of uh, of our activity is in the heavy duty space, class five through eight. Um, in the event you've got uh, those vehicles that qualify and, and you've got some scale, uh, what do we do next? So uh, we would want to coordinate with utilities uh, and understand the gas and electric loads for uh, potentially siting a CNG location, um, as well as you know, some other you know kind of best practices for uh, where and how to deploy a CNG station. So. Uh, those are uh, core competencies of Trillium, uh, amongst uh, other providers in the markets, um, and would really encourage you to identify and utilize your resources. Um, and, and a great one uh, facilitating today with South Shore Clean Cities, I found them to be collaborative, uh, informative, and really kind of a, a catch-all for all things you know, alternative fuel um, and infrastructure as well. So, if you've got interest. Uh, and you want to know where to get started and you want a shortcut or, uh, you know, a short list of best practices, I would encourage you to interface with, uh, with Ryan and the South Shore Clean Cities team uh, on, on fast tracking that conversation. Um, a, a few more bullet points, uh, you know, in, in the events, uh, there are retail locations uh, near or, or, or in close proximity to your facility uh, that you could utilize the CNG station that exists today. Uh, that certainly eliminates a big hurdle. Uh, in that you, know, you have to deploy a new uh, a, a new infrastructure offering, uh, or you've got a great partnership like one that exists in South Bend, where you know uh, municipal fleet is able to utilize infrastructure of a of a you know, sister agency at Transpo uh, and fuel uh, at their facility. Um, I'll highlight again, you know, Ryan's point of you know, state and federal funding. Uh, I think my experience with these projects, especially when there are infrastructure requirements or, or deployment, I should say. Uh, it, it It's beneficial to take the time and see if there are any funding mechanisms that exist for not just the vehicles, but for the station as well, to help offset some of those capital costs required with you know, designing and installing a CNG station for your needs. Uh, and then you know, the last bullet point is, is finding the right partner. Uh, there are uh, several of us that operate in this space today uh, I'm certainly biased to Trillium. Uh, I know we do a great job, but, but there are others that, that do as well. Uh, but but I would flag, you know, you want to make sure you, you find a partner that's uh, been doing this for some time and, and has the, uh, you know, financial backing to continue doing this for, for some time into the future. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'll, um, I'll highlight some uh, some fleets that, you may be familiar with, uh, this is not an all-encompassing list by any means, but uh, it's some of those folks that 
I cross paths with uh, our customers of ours or are, are known to be operating CNG vehicles in Indiana. Um, and I, I won't talk about Transpo or South Bend. You'll hear from them shortly. Uh, but Ruan is, is, you know, taking milk from northern Indiana down to Tennessee using CNG tractors. If you travel 65, you'll see a lot of those uh, red Ruan CNG trucks um, traveling that lane. Uh, City Bus is a uh, another transit agency in, in Lafayette that is, uh, has a, a CNG bus deployment uh, that continues to grow. Delco Foods in Indianapolis uh, is delivering food throughout their network, um, utilizing CNG tractors. Venture Logistics is running car parts in central Indiana um, for, for, for uh, OEM uh, and, and using natural gas. Uh, Monarch Beverage is delivering uh, uh, adult beverages and, and beverages throughout the state using CNG tractors. Uh, there are probably uh, portions of your mail being delivered uh, using CNG tractors, uh, Sheehy Mail, Eagle Express, uh, amongst others. Uh, you know, pull mail with CNG trucks in Indiana. Uh, there's a litany of municipalities that uh, have uh, rolled out CNG you know, vehicles from Muncie to Michigan City to Hobart, uh, you know, down into Southern Indiana, uh, as well as a, a multitude of refuse companies uh, that operate CNG trash trucks today. So uh, I, I've got uh, contacts at many of these, as does South Shore Clean Cities. So uh, if you're a fleet and you want to talk to somebody that has a similar uh, application uh, or you know fleet footprint to yours, they exist. Uh, they're running natural gas today and that can certainly be a valuable tool in your evaluation process. So uh, with that, uh, I don't have uh, a ton more. I, I look forward to, to questions and, and you know, being a resource to uh, certainly any of you that have interest uh, in you know, uh, uh, future uh, considerations for natural gas vehicles or continuing the conversation. Uh, I'll kick it back to you, Ryan. All right, thank you very much, Mark. Once again, we will be answering questions later. If you have any, please feel free to post them um, in the sidebar there. Next up, we have Matt Shablowski. He is the Division Director for the City of South Bend Central Services. And Matt has really been an innovator and a educator from many different areas for other municipal fleets looking at not only CNG, but other operations, and really thank him for taking the time out of his busy schedule to talk with us today. Um, Mr. Shablowski, you are ready to go ahead. Well, thank you, Ryan. Thanks for the invite, and thanks to South Shore Clean Cities for putting this program together, and certainly all the attendees for joining us today. Um, the one question always comes up is, you know, how did we get first get involved in CNG for powering our vehicles and the answer is we started out back in 2012 we were looking for uh, four refuse trucks that were automated and the vendor that was uh, chosen came to us and says you know there's a there's an option you can get that uh, would power these trucks with compressed natural gas um, at the same time, introduced us to your organization, Ryan, which is uh, South Shore Clean Cities. And that really started uh, something for us that was a great partnership um, where you guys led us to where there were some dollars available through the Diesel Wise grant opportunity through IDEM. And we took that program to our city administration. Uh, presented to them. They thought it over. It took quite a while back and forth um, looking at the technologies and then they finally said well if we can receive the grant um, sure let's go ahead and, and, and give it a try. Uh, that way the grant money would help us purchase the vehicles and we could use the savings to get a compressor that would help uh, to fuel those vehicles. So we did apply for a grant, certainly with the help of South Shore Clean Cities. We received a diesel wise grant for about $178,000 to help purchase those vehicles. Uh, we did purchase them. Uh, and then we also, at the same time, we put in a very small compressor. It was only five 
gallon uh, diesel gallon equivalent per hour compressor, but that's all we had in our budget at the time. And um, so what started out eight years ago with our first four trucks uh, today has expanded into, we have 190 vehicles capable of using compressed natural gas as a fuel. And I certainly can't say enough for about South Shore Clean Cities and the help we've received from you in looking for grants and, and other ways of other funding sources to help us uh, continue to grow um, our compressed natural gas fleet. So it's been a great partnership and we do thank you for that. So uh, moving on, um, I can just show you a few here. We have, we currently have six tandem axle dump trucks in our fleet. We have four more on order right now. We should receive by the end of the year. Um, we have 41 pickup trucks or vans. Uh, most of these are bi-fueled. They run on gasoline or compressed natural gas. And our biggest fleet is certainly the police car fleet, which we have 116 patrol cars that um, are again by fuel and can run on gasoline and or uh, compressed natural gas. Um, oh, you, you ask about cost savings uh, and fuel economy. Um, for us, um, and here's a slide that kind of shows, shows it by the numbers. Um, our fuel economy is very difficult for us to determine because at the Riverside Drive fueling uh, station, it is slow fill and it's used for all of our refuge trucks. Um, and we don't we don't meter each truck individually. It comes through the gas meter and it's the bill is just paid and we get a total. So we don't know how much each vehicle is using each day. Um, so it's hard to look at that and say, what is the fuel economy? Same way with the biofueled vehicles. Um, you know, they, they can go either way. So some are using compressed natural gas at times, other times they're using, you know, the gasoline. So um, it's very difficult for us to say this vehicle is doing this on compressed natural gas and maybe something else on liquid fuels. But what I can tell you is that over the years, our total gallon usage, whether it be liquid fuels or the uh, diesel gallon equivalents has not changed drastically in either direction. So I'm I'm saying that our total gallons hasn't changed. Uh, the fuel economy probably hasn't changed a whole bunch. But looking here at the dollars, if you're looking at cost savings, certainly there, there's a huge cost savings when, when you look at using compressed natural gas. And especially if the federal government continues to give us the 50 cent rebate, if we're looking at 2019, uh, um, we used over 175,000 gallons of CNG, and we had a savings dollar-wise with the rebate of over $250,000. So we're looking at, uh, you know, saving about $1.73 a gallon on the diesel side uh, for every gallon that we're using of CNG. Um, and then again, it, it, as you look at this slide, uh, we certainly don't want to forget the greenhouse gases that. Uh, you know, we've eliminated from being put out into the atmosphere by using compressed natural gas as opposed to diesel or, or even gasoline. So it's really a big win-win there for us. And uh, this is the type of thing that allowed us to continue to grow our fleet is, you know, the dollar savings. So it, it was a big deal and it, it continues to be. Um, as far as fueling uh, our vehicles, and I certainly don't want to steal any anything away from Amy over there, but she's been a great help here. Um, here's our two compre our compressor on the left and the transpo fueling station that we use on the right. Uh, like I said, our compressor is very small. This one is 35. We did upgrade once, um, but it still does not fuel our complete refuge uh, fleet overnight. It will over the weekend. So we use the fast fuel station at Transpo. Um, and that is really what allowed us to expand our fleet from the refuge uh, portion, which is 18 trucks right now, to the 100 or 190 that we have today. If we, if we didn't partner with them and support that uh, 
fast fill station, we would not have been able to grow our fleet past the refuge site. So that's been very helpful to us and we will continue to grow uh, and use that fast fill site. Um, there were a few barriers um, and successes with it. Uh, I, I think the big success for us is that we had a supportive administration. Um, they looked at this thing and they they saw that there is a dollar savings. And again, uh, we can't forget, you know, the environmental uh, impact it also has, positive impact that it has. But the real thing is that our, our administration here in the city of South Bend has supported us looking at this. And as long as it makes sense, uh, uh, the dollars and cents, let's put it that way, um, we have we have to go ahead to go ahead and purchase the vehicles that will run on compressed natural gas. So it's really a big win for us. Um, and of course, there are some barriers, but the barriers I feel are the uh, are are the lack of inf of information to people. Uh, we try and educate them. We have uh, educational videos for them, but there's still this fear, and and I don't know if other users are seeing this. I, I hear from others that they do hear from some of it, but there's a fear. They they think this is a, a time bomb waiting to explode in their vehicle. Uh, the fueling procedure is is completely different. It makes noise. It makes funny noises sometimes, um, and they're not sure of it. So. Um, if there's any barrier, it's really the people getting them used to it, educating them, and there's all kinds of videos out there that you can get to, to show how safe uh, natural gas really is. But um, you know, we have people uh, who embrace it, they understand it, they know what it's doing for the environment, how much better it is, but then you get people that just don't want anything to do with it. And uh, that's probably our biggest hurdle right now is trying to get those people on board. So um, as far as it goes, we're, we're gonna continue to look at uh, compressed natural gas as we purchase vehicles, and we're gonna continue to do that, educate our people and uh, go forward with it. It's a great program. Um, future plans for the city of South Bend. Um, here is a scrubber out at the wastewater treatment plant. The one advantage we have is our refuge trucks are located on, on the same campus out there. And what the wastewater treatment plan has done is they've had a makeover and they're capturing the methane and it's going through this scrubbing system. And it's actually being cleaned to the, the same specification that our local NIFSCO uh, gas supplier would have. So it's very clean. And what we're doing is we did run the pipes to our compressor. And again, our compressor is very small at this point in time, but we have adjusted the pressures so that the gas from this uh, scrubbing system and the methane is used first. Anything available, we pump into the trucks first, and then uh, the natural gas will take over from there if we don't have enough methane. Um, their their uh, plant will produce uh, and I don't have all the exact numbers, but it will produce enough to probably fill all of our trucks uh, almost every day. So we're looking at updating that compressor. We're, we're just in the feasibility study right now of upgrading our compressor out there at Riverside Drive, uh, which will allow us to use all the methane. Uh, there's some other uh, advantages. I, I mean, obviously the gas, uh, we're not paying NIFSCO for the fuel anymore. Uh, it's not free because you still have to compress it and use electricity and such, but uh, it's really a big win and there are some rebates they can get from using the methane as a vehicle fuel. So that's uh, something on the horizon we're looking at. Uh, we're doing some studies and getting some dollars on it, what, what that's going to cost to upgrade a compressor. Um, and the other thing is uh, we continued, we're going to continue to look at and, and purchase compressed natural gas vehicles as long as we see that there's a uh, you know payback in the in the cost associated with it, and certainly uh, every opportunity that we have to apply for grants or any other funding sources, uh, we will continue to do that so that we can uh, continue to grow our fleet. And uh, that's about all I have from the city of South Bend right now, and uh, look forward to any questions anyone may have.
All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Shobowski. Appreciate your time. Very interesting. Um, next up, we have Amy Hill. She is the general manager and CEO of South Bend Public Transportation Corporation. Amy has been a leader in uh, public transit by providing a necessary service to individuals at a increasing uh, lowering emission standpoint for their fleet footprint. All right, Amy, thank you very much. Thanks, Ryan, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, certainly a special thank you to MACOG and South Shore Clean Cities and the Green Fleet Program for putting on today's webinar. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about our CNG story here at Transpo. Um, for anyone that may not be aware, Transpo is the public transportation provider for the cities of South Bend and Mishawaka. Uh, we do just over 1.5 million fixed route rides a year and 84,000 paratransit rides. So our total fleet consists of 48 fixed route, um, 35 foot buses, and then 20 of the smaller paratransit vans. Um, we were very fortunate to um, focus on innovation and sustainability for quite some time now. Um, we opened the first LEED Platinum Transit facility in the country back in 2010. Um, it's really a tribute to our, our leadership and board of directors at the time for having that, that vision. Um, we knew that we would be pursuing alternative fuels as part of that commitment to sustainability. Um, you know, once our facility opened, um, we did have a, a substantial aging fleet, um, and we had anticipated that we would be replacing probably up to 10 vehicles within the next couple of years. So um, the building was designed to be easily uh, retrofitted for alternative fuels. So those conversations looked at several different options um, and then ultimately decided that CNG was going to be um, the route for Transpo to pursue. Um, we were fortunate in 2014 to have the arrival of our first um, CNG buses, which were also um, the first new buses Transpo had received in over 11 years. Um, so that was with the arrival of 16 um, compressed natural gas buses from New Flyer Industries. Um, New Flyer has been a tremendous partner for us. Um, the buses are made and manufactured in the United States, and we also worked really closely with them to maximize the, the Indiana components utilized on the vehicle. So um, we're always proud to say that 40% of the components on our buses come from the state of Indiana. Uh, we have a Cummins engine, Allison transmission, our seats and stanchions were actually made and manufactured in Elkhart. So it's not only the um, innovation and sustainability, but it's also reinvesting many times those federal grant dollars um, back into our regional and, and state community by purchasing those Indiana components. Um, after those first uh, 16 initial buses, we had um, an additional three we received in 2015, um, and then three in 2017. And we actually just had our pre-production meeting last week with um, New Flyer, and we have another six buses on order that are expected to be delivered in early 2021. Um, we are very fortunate that we did receive some funding through the CARES Act, and we are utilizing a portion of that funding towards those six buses. And those federal dollars actually uh, will cover 100%. We were not required to come up with a local match for that. So that was really exciting for us. We weren't anticipating to be able to get um, another six replacement buses so quickly. Um, so that's great. By early next year, you know, we'll have 28 um, of our fixed route buses will be compressed natural gas. Um, we still have another 20 that are currently eligible for replacement. Um, the useful life of a, of a bus is 12 years. Um, those 20 buses are all currently 16 to 18 years old. So um, working to secure some funding, we were very fortunate in 2018 to receive a federal grant um, for about 4.9 million that will replace another 12 buses, but we're working um, diligently to secure that local match. We need about a $1.2 million local match. And we've been very fortunate to partner with South Shore Clean Cities. So we're hopeful with the next round of the Volkswagen mitigation funding um, that we'll receive um, some of those dollars that could be used towards our local match so we can move forward with um, replacing the rest of our fleet. Um, as been mentioned, you know, we do have our compressed natural gas fueling center. Um, you may notice our first buses arrived in 2014, but our fueling center didn't open until 2016. So we, we had some challenges initially. Uh, we had these great new buses, but we did not have a way to fuel them. So we were um, fortunate that we were able to partner with AM General and utilize their slow fill station in Mishawaka. So 
Um, that was a good partnership. Uh, we actually debuted these buses in conjunction with the city of South Bend's 150th anniversary. So um, it was a great celebration for the community, but also um, a great way for us to represent the innovation and sustainability that we are planning on moving forward. So our CNG Fueling Center is really um, a great example of how we are able to lever leverage our relationships and partnerships across the region. Um, it was funded through a US Department of Energy grant, um, an FTA grant, DieselWise Indiana grant, and then our partners, the city of South Bend, also helped us with that local match. And so all that was done, you know, in conjunction with the city, MACOG, South Shore Clean Cities. Um, as Mark mentioned, you know, Trillium was, did the design and build, and they continue to do um, the maintenance and operation of our facility. So it, it, it truly is great to see so many different organizations come together and be able to fund this type of facility um, and then help us to expand the CNG usage across the region. Um, the facility was designed to be open to the public for retail sales. Um, that's not an option we've pursued yet, um, but that is something that we continue to look at in the future too. So um, definitely the opportunity to build on the resources that we currently have. Um, certainly our, our fuel savings and um, you know, was a big factor in pursuing CNG. Um, we estimate about a, a savings of $7,500 per bus per year. Um, it's, it's a little skewed right now. We were able to, thanks to COVID-19, lock into some lower diesel rates. So we're, we're trying to uh, put as many miles on those older buses right now um, before they go into retirement to take advantage of those savings. But you can see the breakdown of cost per service mile is pretty significant. Our diesel buses run um, at 62 cents per mile and new flyer at 35 cents. So um, add those up and that's another 6,700 on top of the fuel savings that we're seeing each year. Um, as far as the, the parts and labor savings with our maintenance department, we estimate that right around um, $3,000 a year. Um, one of the things that's important to point out with that, that doesn't take into consideration all those other older diesel buses that are, you know, six to 18 years, 16 to 18 years old, many of those that have their original engines and transmissions. So um, true numbers, it's, it's a lot more, obviously, maintaining an older vehicle is more expensive than a newer vehicle. Um, there are some added costs that come along with our, our CNG buses. Um, we do have some additional inspections for the fuel tanks, also the fire suppression systems. Um, but all in all, even when you combine those, um, we're still seeing about $3,000 savings per bus per year. Uh, we, we did invest a significant amount um, in training. Um, obviously, not having a new vehicle in over 11 years, it, even taking out the, the CNG, there was a, a lot of technological technological upgrades that we had to train, um, not just our drivers, but maintenance staff, and that also extended out to the community. Um, you know, because uh, CNG vehicles are still relatively new, we had to train first responders. So we worked with New Flyer and created a training pro program for police and fire, um, you know, in case there would be an incident with, with one of our buses that they would need to know how to properly respond. So um, all in all, we, we look at, you know, about an estimated savings of just over 17,000 um, per bus. So it certainly makes sense for us um, to continue to move forward um, with CNG. It's been um, a relatively easy transition for us. Um, you know, and we continue to, to, to do that. You know, as mentioned, we'll have another um, 20 buses that need to be replaced. So, you know, leveraging partnerships with South Shore Clean Cities and other organizations um, is key for us. You know, the, the future for us, we, uh, we will continue to pursue CNG. It's, um, it is exciting to see how quickly the technology is changing with other um, fuel sources, such as, you know, battery electric buses and hydrogen, as, as Mark mentioned. So we continue to look at other options as well. But again, you know, CNG has been, you know, a great option for us. It's been a relatively smooth transition and we do plan to continue um, pursuing CNG. So um, you know, we're excited to share a little bit about our story and also, you know, excited to build on our, our sustainability as we move forward. So I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit today. Terrific. Thank you very much, Amy. Now, if you do have any questions, please go ahead and type those in. And if you have a question specific to one of our presenters today, go ahead and make sure that uh, you denote that in your question. I have a question and it pretty much goes to anyone who want, would like to talk, but this is a very unique and strategic relationship for both a uh, 
public transit fleet and a municipality to share a station, if you will. How did that come about? Because that's, we don't see that in a lot of other cities across, uh, at least in Indiana. How did that all start? That's a great question. <laughs> I, I really think it started with our public works department and our public works director um, at that point in time, I think uh, was um, very supportive of compressed natural gas as a fuel, uh, could see what the future was going to and could be. And I, I'm really not sure behind the scenes how Transpo and the city of South Bend, I was not involved in that. Um, so I'm not really sure how they came together, but I, I do know our public works department was really behind it and supportive. And, and then certainly I know um, the administration would have, would have been the same way. So I, I don't know if you have more information on how that really came about, Amy. Sure, no, Matt, I think Matt's absolutely right. It really was um, the leadership with public works and, and having that vision. Um, I don't think either of us could have independently pursued a station of this caliber without working together. You know, and the fact working with organizations like the South Shore Clean Cities to really help us secure a lot of grant funding and then really, um, you know, the city of South Bend had a financial contribution as well too that kind of helped us meet those goals of, of securing local matches for grants. So it really was a collaborative effort and, and a pooling of resources in order to have that vision, you know, not just for Transpo, not just for the city, but to really make this kind of a step forward for the region. So. Perfect. Thank you very much. Because for the city of South Bend, you know, to have that the time fill station for themselves, and then have the uh, redundancy of a fast fill station still in uh, the city is great. Um, we have some questions. I am going to. This one is from Steve Barnes, um, and that's not a question. We have one question. This one is for Mark Rowe. Mark, which corridors in northern Indiana are are in most need of more public CNG fueling infrastructure? Um, from a South Bend to Indy or a Fort Wayne to Northwest Indiana, what's your thoughts? We see a lot of the good movements traveling east and west, and, and I think 80, you know, 94, that northern stretch of the corridor, you know, probably has the most opportunity. Um, you know, and, and I would I would add on to that by saying, you know, 65 does have some good coverage, as does 70. So uh, that that would be my short answer is uh, the focus on the 8094 corridor. Uh, but they they could all use, uh, you know, um, and, and I think there's room for growth on, on all major thoroughfares, you know, that that cross Indiana. Um, and the more stations means more vehicles, which means lower costs for, you know, your future, you know, vehicle purchases, et cetera, et cetera. So everybody wins with, with more deployment. All right, thank you. We're gonna have a question for Amy, but I think uh, this can also be answered uh, by Matt as well. This comes down to a driver preference as far as CNG or diesel buses at Transpo or CNG vehicles for the, uh, let's go with tandem um, dump trucks for the uh, the city of South Bend. What do the drivers prefer? Amy, you should go first. Sure, for South Bend, our drivers definitely prefer CNG. And I think the one caveat is, I don't know how much that is due to the CNG or the fact that, well, sure, I'd rather drive a bus that's two years old instead of a bus that's 18 years old. So. Um, there was a little bit of an adjustment period. We did have a few operators when we first started um, preferred to drive the older buses, but I think with CNG, you're talking about a bus that's, um, it's certainly much quieter, um, lower emissions, and just um, the new technology associated with a newer vehicle. Um, it's been a little bit of a challenge right now um, with COVID-19. We've really been trying, we're running a reduced service schedule right now and, and trying to put as many miles on the older buses as much as we can. And we do hear it from the drivers because a lot of them would, would prefer to be driving um, a new flyer with the CNG. Um, you know, our maintenance workers, they've been um, very complimentary of the CNG. Um, they are the ones that fuel the vehicles. So they really, um, 
that was a pretty easy adjustment for them. It certainly was a little bit different and, and required quite a bit of training, but um, you know, they do prefer um, the fueling of the CNG vehicles over the diesel. Thank you, Amy. Matt? Yep, I, I would have to agree with Amy. I think our drivers prefer the CNG. Uh, one of their issues is really the regenerating of the diesel trucks. Uh, you know, the exhaust catalyst needs to be regen every now and then, um, and they really don't like that. And it, and and the noise uh, volume is much lower with the CNG. Um, I, I really think they all prefer it. Uh, they're not seeing any loss of power or anything like that. Uh, they just think it's a quieter, smoother running engine. They prefer to, to be in that truck, especially if they're out there uh, plowing snow for, for hour after hour, you know, up to 12 hours a day behind the wheel of that truck. Uh, they really prefer the quieter truck, smoother running truck. Um, no issues with the fueling that, uh, as far as I know, with the truck side of it. And uh, that is what they do prefer. And it is newer. <laughs> Amy, you're correct. They do like the newer vehicle. Now, this question is going to be open to everyone, but I'm going to ask it to Mark. And Mark, with all the, the new technologies and the fuels and vehicles coming out from a electric hydrogen uh, perception perspective, excuse me, as far as CNG is a, more adoption is coming through on the infrastructure side, uh, what's just your general take on the future of alternative fuels for North America? Uh, my, my crystal ball would say I, I see CNG remaining relevant for um, you know, decades into the future. Uh, there, there's a very solid uh, network of uh, OEM products on the vehicle side and a growing uh, you know, fueling infrastructure uh, that exists today. Uh, that, that is a, a, a large investment by a lot of uh, organizations that I don't see going away. Um, if I looked at a zero emission solution, you know, battery electric or hydrogen, uh, it sure seems like there's a lot of uh, investment being, you know, uh, poured into those uh, those platforms. Uh, I, I think ultimately uh, it's an all of the above strategy, Ryan. Um, I think if if you're ready to deploy today and you want something that's proven and that works and is reliable, uh, CNG has a lead on that. Um, if you're you know, looking for uh, what's next, I, I think you'll start to see uh, all three, uh, you know, battery electric, hydrogen uh, powered fuel cells, as well as you know, compressed gas uh, vehicles uh, be relevant for, for some time into the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question is for Amy. Now, Amy, did you get any reaction from your riders to the change or uh, any kind of feedback from when you first introduced the CNG buses to the different routes? Uh, we, we did. We, we got a lot of um, immediate and positive feedback. Um, again, certainly having a newer vehicle, but also one that, you know, runs que cleaner and is it's much more quiet when you operate it. Um, you know, certainly... We've even heard from non-riders, just from other members of the general public, you know, driving behind a bus or when they hear a bus pass, just that that difference. Um, so overall, the feedback was was really positive from our riders. Um, we continue to receive feedback because they keep asking, <laughs> when are we going to have newer buses to replace some of those older ones too? So um, that's that's been really good, um, especially when we debuted the the buses for the city of South Bend's uh, 150th anniversary. That was a time to really get um, a broader sense of the general public out there on, on a transit bus and to see the technology and to see how quiet they were. Um, that was a great opportunity, but we continue to receive positive feedback. So um, like I said, we're just, we're excited to kind of retire more of those, those noisy, dirty diesel buses and, and add additional CNG vehicles to our fleet. All right, thank you very much. The next, um, question that we have is can go to all the panelists now uh, what would you tell a fleet manager that was introducing CNG into their fleet where to start uh, if I can um, certainly 
contact one of us. <laughs> no, anyone who's using it because it is a big learning curve. Um, there's a lot to learn. Uh, there's a lot of things that we didn't know about in the beginning that, that we learned over the first couple of years. Uh, certainly get a hold of South Shore Clean Cities uh, because there is uh, dollars out there that are available. Certainly you want to go after that, but there's a lot of education. You need to educate yourself um, so that you know where you're going and you can present it to whoever you need to present it to in either your municipality or your business. Uh, so that everyone understands um, where you're going with it, why you're going to do it, and then, uh, yeah, educate everyone. I think that's the biggest biggest part is making sure everyone's educated on it. Okay, I have one more kind of question for you, Matt, and this strictly deals at the uh, wastewater treatment facility. So normally in other operations across the country, that methane would be flared. And I just want to have everyone make sure that that knows you're collecting that methane, correct, and, and what you're doing with it. How do those, those rings and collecting that methane uh, come full circle for the city of South Bend and your fleet? Well, actually it started with them wanting to use it in their boilers because they have to heat that water in the winter. So, and they also have a blower engine out there in their process that can run on the methane or was running on natural gas. So when they had to go through and do an upgrade of the plant, they put the covers on those digesters and the operation started uh, gathering that methane and storing it so that then, then they brought the scrubber online. And I, I think the first intent was maybe it would go into the NIPSCO line to get paid back from NIPSCO because they were cleaning it to their specification, but then found out that NIPSCO really wasn't going to give you a whole lot for it. Um, and then it, it came about where there is dollars available if you use it as a fuel in your trucks. Uh, so they went more in that direction. Uh, if you go by the plant, you're still going to see some flaring going on. And my understanding is uh, the cleaning process does not clean 100% of the methane. So there is still some dirty methane that, that goes to the flare. So that, that flaring fire will still be there, but uh, they are cleaning it. Um, and we are using a majority of it in the trucks. And then uh, it is better for them to send it to us and get the RINs and pay NIFSCO for the gas that they need to heat the uh, run their boilers and such. So that's their plan. All right, thank you very much. That is a great example of a closed loop system um, and renewable fuel. Um, we're gonna wrap it up for today. I would like to thank our present, present, pres presenters and also uh, please be, a look at, be on the lookout for our next webinar, Electric Vehicle Charging Infrastructure, and other webinars throughout the summer into early fall. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact South Shore Clean Cities, or please contact the presenters directly. Thank you all very much, and have a wonderful day. You're welcome. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Thanks. Take care.